Hi, this lecture is about optimum reception of a plane wave by a ULA. So by ULA, I mean, as usual, uniform linear array. That's an array consisting of elements which are evenly spaced along the line, as shown in the picture in the lower left of this uh, screen right now. I'm going to be assuming isotropic elements, uh, at least for now, for this lecture. In practice, uh, there really is no such thing as an isotropic element. That is, there's no such thing as an element which has uniform response uh, over all spatial directions. But that distinction is not so important for this lecture and will not affect the results. By plane wave, I mean a wave that has planar phase fronts. That's what you expect to see from a source which is very far away, right? In general, sources radiate spherical waves, right? That like uh, ripples in a pond. But if you are far from the source and you look over just a tiny region, that phase front looks planar and uniform. The magnitude doesn't seem to change over that phase front. So this is an appropriate thing to consider for sources which are far away. The bottom left shows the particular scenario. X sub naught indicates the signal being received at that location. Now I realize this is a little bit um, uh, awkward. X is not a spatial coordinate here. X is the waveform. So uh, the elements are uniformly spaced. X is not the position along that axis. X is the waveform that's being recorded at that point. So here's X naught, X1, X2, and we can keep going up to uh, N minus 1. We'll count like C programmers for the purpose of this lecture. So we go from 0 to n minus 1 to have n elements. The plane wave arrives from an angle theta naught measured with respect to the axis of the array. So theta naught equals 0 means n fire. And theta naught equals pi over 2 radians, or 90 degrees, means broadside. And we can now easily write expressions for the signals that arrive at each sensor each element. For example, x0 we can write as a, which is some complex valued constant, times e to the j psi0, where psi0 is a real valued constant, and I may refer to that as a reference phase. So what a and psi0 are are not exactly important at the moment, and you'll see why. When I write the expression for x sub 1, well, that's just going to be A, the magnitude and phase of that wave that's arriving. Now, for the signal arriving at the first sensor, X sub 1, the only thing that's going to be different is the phase of that wave, and it's going to be different by an amount delta psi, where delta psi has to do with this projected distance, right? To get to sensor 1, we have to travel this additional distance, and we'll call that additional electrical distance, that is how many radians of phase, uh, delta psi. So, so the signal x sub 1 is the same except the phase is different by delta psi. And note that we can separate this complex exponential into two complex exponentials, the first one being a times e to the j psi naught, and the second one being e to the minus j delta psi. And we recognize that first factor as being simply x sub naught. So we can rewrite this expression as x sub naught times just uh, a factor which indicates the additional phase accrued because of the propagation. x sub 2 then will be, by the exact same reasoning, x sub naught times e to the minus j delta psi, but now squared because we'll have twice the uh, distance. And similarly, or extending that idea, x sub n is x sub naught times e to the minus j delta psi raised to the n. So that's a complete description, as far as we're concerned at the moment, of the signals arriving each one of these sensors. So now let's consider how we might combine those signals to make a, a beamformer output. And there are really any number of ways that we can imagine forming a beam, that is combining these things into one signal. But the one I want to consider here I will refer to as phase-only conventional beamforming. Now again, everybody has a different name for this. For example, communications theorists might refer to this as equal gain combining. 
The idea here is that we take the first element and we multiply it by a phase. That is a complex exponential with a magnitude of 1. So here, e to the j xi naught. And similarly, x1 is multiplied by e to the j xi 1. And we continue up to the n minus 1 uh, element. And then we take those and we add them all up, as indicated here, to get one signal, which we deem the output. So y is the output. And we see that the mathematical expression that we have described using this diagram is the sum from 0 to n minus 1, that is the sum over the elements, x sub n multiplied by e to the j xi n. So the psi's are the propagation related phases, and the xi's are the phases that we apply in the process of doing beam forming. Now we can make the substitution for x sub n. And we'll do that right there, using the expression we just derived. And we see that x sub naught, that is a signal at the reference element, can be pulled out of this sum. And what remains does not depend on the signal. It just depends on the angle at which the wave arrives, that is represented by uh, psi, and the phases that we use in the beamformer, that is the xi's. This expression here, this sum, which again depends only on geometry and the phase shifts that we apply, and not at all on the signal, is called the array factor, or AF is the abbreviation. And it really is the description of the system, the array is a system. So here's the input, and we multiply it by some system, which we'll refer to as array factor, and we get the beamformer output. So, um, we have not answered the question what those xi's should be. In other words, what should these phase shifts be that we apply? The answer to this question is, if we are trying to maximize the power at the output, well, the power is maximized when the magnitude of the output is maximized, given the assumptions we've already made. That should be pretty clear. And the magnitude of the output is maximized when each term in the array factor has the same phase, right? What we have in the array factor is a sum of complex exponentials. And the biggest result will occur when all those complex exponentials have the same phase. Now, it doesn't matter whether that phase is zero or pi or any other number. All that matters is that all the exponentials have the same phase so that they add in phase and get the, give us the biggest overall magnitude. So. Without loss of generality, we'll let this phase be equal to zero. And then xi n should be n times delta psi n. This choice for the phase shifts will cause every one of the phases of the arguments to be equal to zero, so they'll add in phase. So if we do that, y under this choice for the phase shifts gives us simply n times the signal at the reference element. In other words, the array factor for this particular choice of phase shifts is n, just the constant n. This sum reduces to n, the number of elements in the array. Note that the power of the beamformer output is proportional to the magnitude squared of the output, right? So the power of the output of the beamformer is going to be proportional to n squared. It's just the array factor squared. So the power at the output of the beamformer using this scheme that we've just described, phase only beamforming, maximizing power, equal gain combining, whatever you want to call it, gives us something which is proportional to n squared. Now, at this point, let me identify a very common pitfall that uh, even experts fall into from time to time. This does not mean that the directivity of the system is proportional to n squared. All we're saying is that the power at the output is proportional to n squared. Remember, directivity refers to power relative to average power, that is power averaged over all spatial directions. And we really haven't addressed what the power over all spatial directions is yet. There will be some conditions in which directivity is proportional to n squared. In fact, it's equal to n squared. Uh, there will be many other conditions in which it is not equal to n squared and could be very, very different. So just dropping that on you now so that you don't make that mistake in the future.
Now, returning to the main thread of the lecture here, um, what is delta psi, right? I mean, in order to use this beam forming scheme where we set the coefficients equal to uh, some multiple of delta uh, psi, we need to know what delta psi is. Well, we just look at this picture. So we can write that down mathematically in the following way. Delta psi, that electrical length experienced between elements, is equal to the element spacing, which I'll call D, times cosine of that angle, cosine theta naught. And that gives us a distance, right? But we want to convert distance to phase. So that's 2 pi over lambda gives us um, uh, electrical uh, distance, electrical length or phase, whatever you want to call it. So it's common to combine d and lambda here. That's uh, this element spacing and wavelengths, and then pull 2 pi out front. So delta psi is uh, 2 pi times the element spacing and wavelengths times this factor cosine theta naught. So pretty simple idea. Subsequently, the optimum, that is equal gain combining choice for the phase shifts, is going to be simply this expression times n. So 2 pi times n times the spacing and wavelengths times cosine theta naught. And that's really all there is to it. Now just keep in mind, this is only one of myriad ways to do beam forming, but is an important one, and it's uh, essential to know at least this much before engaging in more complex schemes for beam forming. So you might ask the question, what makes this a beam? What makes this a beam? I mean, when we're transmitting, it's pretty obvious what a beam is, right? We can measure power density in different directions and say that the beam points in a direction where the power density is greatest and is not pointing in directions where the power density is less. But here we're receiving. So what does it mean to have a beam on receive? Well, the answer to that question uh, really uh, pivots on the following question, which is, to consider what happens when we assume that the beam is arriving from a particular direction and design the phase shifts that way, but in fact the wave comes from a different direction, which is uh, theta sub i. So to say that another way, let's imagine we set up the uh, beam former for a particular direction, theta naught, but the plane wave actually arrives from a different direction, theta super i. No problem, we can figure out what the response is going to be in that case. The beam forming expression is y times the signal at the reference element times the array factor. That None of that changes. Uh, what does change is that the actual propagation induced phase shifts, the delta size, these things are going to depend on theta super i, not theta sub naught. So expanding that out, the first uh, part of this complex exponential is 2 pi n d over lambda cosine theta naught. And the second part, which is depending on the actual angle of incidence, is 2 pi n d over lambda cosine theta i. So there's a difference in those two things, right? Now, if we chose theta naught to be equal to theta i, this collapses down to the previous expression, and we just get n for everything in the brackets here. But when they're different, we get something which is a little bit more complicated. It looks like this. And the array factor can be viewed as being a function of the direction of uh, incidence, the actual direction of incidence. So I've shown some plots here to illustrate that. This is array factor, the magnitude of the array factor. That is the magnitude of the thing in the brackets here. As a function of the actual angle of incidence. And the blue curve here, this blue curve, the beam is pointed broadside, pi over 2. So if we plot the array factor, which is going to be proportional now to the magnitude of the output of the beam former, we see a maximum uh, where we expect, and at other angles, that is if we move the angle of incidence away, we see a smaller response. And just to drive home the point, if we were to point the beam in some other direction, that is, if we were to choose phase shifts assuming uh, some other direction of incidence, and then vary the direction of incidence, we would see something like this, where the response is greatest in some other direction, and we get a similar kind of response.
These images here, these responses, are what we refer to as the beam in the receive case. So in the receive case, we can define a beam, but the beam is really a description of the response of the array. That is, the response as a function of angle of incidence given a particular choice for pointing. I will conclude this lecture by making one final uh, observation here. This concept of beam forming on receive is uh, really closely related to directivity in the transmit case. Uh, we may or may not have discussed in what ways directivity on receive is related to directivity on transmit. We see here that there seems to be some connection, right? That it's, we're getting beam patterns, or we can define beam patterns on receive. We have a way of defining beam patterns on transmit, which is pertaining to directivity. Perhaps directivity also is a receive concept. That we will address in, uh, in another lecture.